In the evening of July 21st, 1896, many birthday guests collected on Cleveland's public square. They stood next to a gigantic white arch spanning Superior Avenue. The flags of all nations flew high on the arch's parapet, and when the sun set, a thousand electric lights flickered to life on its summit. As midnight approached, the guests blew whistles and cheered. Cannons boomed and 100 guns offered a birthday salute. The city of Cleveland was 100 years old. A few days later, the women of Cleveland held their own observance of Cleveland Centennial. A year in the planning, the day-long festivities were organized by the women's department. A group of 2,000 women who each paid one dollar for the privilege of helping. The day began with an 8.15 a.m. mass meeting next to the public square statue of Moses Cleveland. During the afternoon, parade organizers of the department, unaccustomed to appearing in public, rode heavily veiled in horse-drawn carriages. On December 18, 1896, a 35-member Women's Centennial Commission was formed to link the women of 1896 with the women of 1996. The women placed $100 with the Society for Savings, the accumulated amount to be used in 1996. Each woman was to name a successor to replace her within the commission until 100 years had passed. The women sealed the list of their accomplishments during Cleveland's centennial year into an aluminum casket and gave it to the Western Reserve Historical Society for safekeeping. In 1996, this box was to be opened by a direct descendant of a commission member. Mrs. Avery, chairman of the commission's executive committee, placed a letter from the women's department to the women of 1996 into the casket. If it were possible to bridge the span of 100 years, how would we reply to that letter with its many questions and concerns for the women who live in 1996? What would we want to show these gentle women of 1896 about ourselves, our mothers, our grandmothers, and our great-grandmothers? We of today reach forth our hands across the gulf of 100 years to yesterday to hold your hands and ours to thank you for our heritage. We thank you for our city of two centuries, still prosperous and beautiful, and yet still far from our ideal. But perhaps the changes are significant enough to please you. You wrote that some of your streets were not yet well lighted. Some were unpaved and many were unclean. It took almost 30 years for electricity to win out over gas street lighting. But if we complain about lighting today, it is most often how light pollution from the city keeps us from seeing the stars. In 1996, our streets are paved, and though we have no gargantuan task like the 440 miles of muddy Cleveland roads that needed paving in 1896, we struggle to repair a seemingly endless number of potholes. Euclid Avenue, your main street of 1896, was compared to Paris's Champs-Élysées for its beautiful, stately trees. These later died because of automobile and industry-generated pollution, the so-called black clouds of progress. We now have laws regulating air quality and favoring reforestation. You wrote us of the many unemployed and working poor of your time. Sadly, this is also a problem in 1996, and yet we can be proud of the efforts of many Cleveland women in attempting to solve this problem. Working to end poverty was something that concerned women from Cleveland's earliest days on. Assistance for the sick and poor came from relatives, private individuals, and churches. Women were believed to be well suited to charity work because of their natural nurturing tendencies. Women relief volunteers of the early 19th century visited the homes of the poor. Those deemed worthy were then given donated food or used clothing. 
Specifically excluded from receiving aid were those who persisted in a criminal course of life or in the use of intoxicating liquors and the willfully idle. Poverty was frequently considered a moral or spiritual failing. Because of this, many religious relief volunteers believed their mission was not only to provide food and clothing, but to provide religious instruction as well. While middle class women continued to work in poor relief during the Civil War, young immigrant and country girls moved to the city to take factory and sales jobs left behind by men who were sent away to fight. As you know, dear women of 1896, in your time, 10,000 women were working in Cleveland. Three quarters of them were domestic servants, laundry workers, dressmakers, and milliners. Women also worked in bakeries, cigar and tobacco plants, garment shops, woolen mills, and paper box factories. The typical work week was 60 hours long. Average pay was $5 per week. Wages earned by daughters were vital to family maintenance and were turned over to mothers. In 1868, when returning Civil War veterans took away the better paying jobs, a group of middle class Cleveland women formed the Women's Christian Association to help care for the spiritual, moral, mental, social, and physical welfare of these young girls. They understood that working class women without money, voting rights, or social position could be ignored by factory owners and politicians. Frequently, these women became easy prey for male employers and unscrupulous acquaintances, and while patrons of prostitutes received only a $5 fine, the prostitutes were given 60-day jail sentences. The Cleveland WCA quickly built a boarding house to give young, white working women a wholesome place to live. They also built the retreat, a home for unwed mothers and for girls who had been sexually compromised. Girls were required to attend Bible class and were given lessons in domestic skills and a good common education so they could support themselves honestly. By 1903, the association, now known as the Young Women's Christian Association, was offering classes in English, typewriting, stenography, sewing, dressmaking, physical education, and Bible study. Because only a very few factory workers had the opportunity to attend the YWCA facility, members also organized women's clubs in Cleveland factories. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was a group of women who declared war on Cleveland saloons because, quote, there is seen on every hand the devastation of homes and the wreck of women's hopes, and it will be continued so long as mothers' hearts are broken, children's lives blighted, wives tortured and even killed outright by the fiends which the saloon produces." Unquote. The temperance union built friendly inns where men received cheap room and board. Their residences for women included the open door for unwed mothers, and a training home for friendless girls, where girls were trained as domestic servants. Temperance workers visited the workhouse, jail, and police station to rescue women and girls in trouble. In 1869, Bishop Lewis Rapp brought the Sisters of the Good Shepherd to Cleveland to establish a Catholic home for wayward girls and fallen but penitent women. Rapid industrialization in the last decades of the 19th century, as well as record levels of immigration, led to increased overcrowding, poverty, corruption, and disease. In the 1890s, Cleveland's population was still 27% foreign-born. Twenty years later, Cleveland's Haymarket District was made up of 30 different nationalities.